So, hello everybody, and um, this video is both a bit of a pledge, uh, because I have, well, I have said this quite a long time, uh, but now I'm promising that I'm going to <laughs> become better at uh, producing World of the Crafts uh, videos for you. Uh, I'm thinking about once a month, uh, so that should be doable, I think. Uh, this video, except for that short announcement, uh, is going to be about how difficult it is to, uh, well, to decipher sex and gender in archaeological research and excavation. Uh, there has been a few stories floating around uh, about uh, archaeologists that have thought that they have found a male or a female grave and then they have found out that uh, it was the other way around. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off with uh, discussing some kind of, well, a bit of field documentation uh, that we use trying to decipher gender and sex uh, in the field and where it can go wrong and what we can do about it. Uh, first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that uh, any kind of field interpretation is difficult. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know when we're still on the field and that we discover as we go along and things are often also going on fairly rapidly uh, because we're also always on a tight schedule so determining sex in graves during field work, work is done mostly to my, my knowledge uh, with uh, these two methods uh, they can be used uh, together which is great when they are <laughs> Uh, but um, it could be difficult uh, depending on uh, anything from resources to time management or what kind of uh, qualifications you have in the excavation. And uh, fir the first method is uh, basically looking at uh, the context and the finds in the grave aside from the physical remains. Uh, so we're talking jewelry, clothes, uh, any, any kind of grave goods really. Uh, and trying to make an interpretation from that. Uh, and then we also have, well, field osteology, which is great when we can afford, afford it or the expertise is there and we have time. Uh, field osteology, though, is hard. Uh, the remains may or may not be intact. Uh, parts might be missing or decomposition of the body uh, can make it really hard to tell uh, what kind of sex we're dealing with. Uh, also, not all archaeologists are trained osteologists, so that can also sometimes make it impossible to do this kind of examination in the field. Now, some of you are probably wondering how a bone specialist attempts to identify the sex of a skeleton. Well, there are a few key indicators. The skull is very important. Prominent brow ridges or a strong connection to the neck at the so-called mastoid process may indicate a male skull. However, a wide gonial flare or jawbone may indicate a female skeleton. Men tend to have squarer jaws and foreheads which slant backwards. Women tend to have rounder foreheads. Obviously the pelvis or hip bone might be an indicator of sex. In women, they have to accommodate, after all, a potential birth. And finally, there's the overall quality of the skeleton. Thicker, heavy-set bones tend to belong to males, whereas females tend to have a more gracile skeletal structure. Though, all of this falls well within what we call non-metric variation. In other words, you can have heavy-set females and gracile males. So it's by no means simple to sex a skeleton. Determining sex due to contextual finds is problematic, to say the least. Uh, there are often a uh, set order of tr or tradition uh, of established gender-specific grave goods for each culture that you're excavating. Um, things that are considered to be male or female, depending on where they are or how they're found. Um, that however doesn't always fit the bill. So, well, this is all both based upon our interpretation uh, and, well, our current knowledge of the culture that we're excavating. excavating. Um, and uh, it, it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, 
the water is there because most of the time it seems to be kind of right uh, but there's there are clearly uh, situations where this kind of contextual grave goods uh, isn't enough to determine the gender and sex of a person. Uh, I should also point out at the point that uh, uh, the difference between gender and sex uh, when you were talking archaeology. Gender has to do with societal norms, uh, roles and cultural expression. Uh, sex is uh, clearly well, it's just the medical examination and determination of the person. Uh, so it has nothing to do with uh, well, with gender. Uh, or it could have, but it, not always. And uh, while sex is purely a medical determination, gender has uh, a lot of other implications. And gender and sex isn't always interchangeable. So hence you use it in different times. <laughs> um, the list of ga uh, graves that are missexed or misgendered uh, due to interpretation of finds are long. Uh, I'm just going to drop a few examples here so you can see what I'm talking about, but I could go on forever. Uh, if you have any uh, interesting uh, examples, please, please, please comment in, in the comment section uh, so I can add them to my list of things I can drop on people. Um, I like discussing this. Um, we're going to start with my favorite. Uh, it's the women buried in the Osseberg ship in Norway. Uh, they were, cons oh well, the main, the main female uh, was uh, considered to be male uh, before osteological evidence proved otherwise. Uh, it was considered a king's burial. Uh, we had swords, we had horses, we have uh, uh, some kind of brackets that they have uh, interpreted as Buddhas. Um, it's a really interesting ship and archaeological find, so check it out, I'm going to link it. Um, we, anyway, it's one of the biggest ship burials found in Scandinavia, and it's amazing. Uh, and uh, there are two women buried there. Uh, there's some discussion about the relationship between the women. Uh, some say that one is the servant, others say that nah, maybe not, but um, they're both women, anyway. That's the important bit here. Uh, and one of them was considered to be male because it was a male burial. Uh, it's not. Uh, this is just the most famous example, but this is kind of... It, it's not uncommon in Scandinavian archaeology when we're talking Iron Age and the Vikings. Uh, to have a missexing or misgendered interpretation of the burials. Uh, I can, on the top of my head, think of 10, 12, 12 other cases uh, where Iron Age and Viking graves has been determined to be male uh, when their inhabitants were female, purely based on the grave goods. Uh, we also have the woman of Bekkaskog, uh, which is a Swedish example of an uh, early Mesolithic burial uh, of a woman. Uh, she was buried with uh, tools for fishing and hunting, and hence she was judged to be a male uh, until uh, C14 uh, and dental studies uh, proved that she was not. Uh, she's also one of the best burials for the Maglemossa culture in Sweden, so... Yay! Uh, female fishers, we like that. Um, we also have, if we move outside of Scandinavia, which is wildly crazy, uh, we have earlier this year uh, archaeologists in Tuscany, Italy, uh, finding a uh, Etruscan tomb. And they believed at first that the skeleton of, were to be remains of an Etruscan prince who was holding a spear and had a fibula that, on his chest, so it indicated that he had been wearing a mantle of sorts. Uh, he was also accompanied with a cremated remains of what they thought was his wife uh, who was jeweled and uh, was placed on a second platform and uh, there were food remains uh, within a long, large uh, bronze basin at his feet so it was to them a clearly classical Etruscan prince grave. Uh, later research uh, showed that the prince was a princess and uh, that uh, the wife was male. So. It goes to prove that uh, it's not only in Scandinavia that we do these kind of things. 
Um, we also have the very confusing and kind of hard to get a grip on uh, story that floated earlier this month about the female Amazon warrior of Siberia uh, being male. She's not, if I have figured everything out right. Um, things are very confusing when you read the Siberian Times article uh, and then you read the archaeology, the archaeological article that tries to explain how the well they they re uh, retracted the Siberian Times too and corrected it. Uh, but um, here we have the classical, uh, sadly classical. Uh, example of how writing confusingly makes people not understand what you're meaning. Uh, so they have uh, had a misinterpretation of gender in with one of the remains uh, found in this mound in Siberia. Uh, thing is that it's not the female warrior; she is female. Uh, it was another burial within the mound that has had uncovered that an uh, adolescent girl uh, was an adolescent boy. Uh, and uh, this boy was buried with an older man who, due to DNA results, uh, that both proved that he was male uh, and that he is uh, related to this older man. Um, they think that it might be an uh, uncle nephew. Uh, when they previously thought that he was a father-daughter. Uh, and this this caused a lot of confusion because the Berens time first thought that they talked about this female warrior who was also found in this mound, uh, but they didn't. So, yeah, the, this uh, proves two things <laughs> that I wanted to talk about. Uh, you have to be clear when you write about things because not everyone ex understands or grasps when you write about uh, burial ABC in grave X rather than uh, burial ABC2 in grave X. They might think that it's the same thing uh, when it's not. So you have to be clear. Um, it also brings up uh, the, the thing about DNA testing uh, and um, there's a few things that need to be said about DNA testing when it comes to historical remains. Uh, DNA studies on all the skeletal remains are difficult uh, because DNA degrades during time uh, so it makes uh, any kind of extraction hard on historical remains. Uh, they are also very easily contaminated, especially when it comes to human DNA. Uh, if we have uh, non-human DNA, contamination is easier to detect because well, it's not human DNA all of a sudden. Um, and uh, well, yeah. So we have horror stories from when I started it uh, of uh, poor researchers being flabbergasted when they found out that uh, the what they had thought was a coat or lamb bone uh, due to the DNA results now was a chicken uh, due to him having chicken for lunch and not having gone through the right com uh, decommunication processes afterwards. Uh, but that's an extreme example and most DNA research is made to a very high standard and have good proportions to prevent contamination. But one should always remember that all humans can fault, even scientists. And uh, it also brings up uh, this, uh, all many people buried in the same mound, uh, takes up multiple burials. Uh, it's not uncommon and it's very difficult. Uh, a lot of different cultures bury their dead together. Uh, megalithic cultures in Scandinavia, as an example, reuses megalithic tombs over centuries, uh, which makes uh, the bones of the dead intermingle and they sometimes even sort them uh, during the years. So. There can be hundreds of individuals in the same space, young, old, male, female. Uh, sometimes we even have uh, grave goods in the grave uh, which uh, has animal bones in them, so we, we even have non-humans. Uh, and that makes work, work and life so much harder. Uh, but uh, we, that is also a case when it comes to uh, trying to decipher 
individual gender uh, and talking about individual stories in these kind of multiple burial uh, contexts that you can you can get it contaminated um, and you can like get some bones wrong some some bones you don't uh, mistake for the wrong gender like pelvises uh, but ribs mm. uh. um, also the most damaging uh, thing in this whole smorgasbord of things that can go wrong uh, is uh, the preconceived notions of what gender is uh, they're very common in archaeology sad to say uh, and in society as a whole uh, and though some have some serious research behind them uh, far too many just rest on old notion of what male and female is uh, and also takes in a lot from well, their time into what they think that old times were like uh, and that leads to all kind of mistakes um, so when you find archaeological finds that doesn't fit these preconceived notions of what gender is you always have uh, the risk of getting things wrong uh, and uh, this brings up the most important quote I have ever learned studying archaeology and it applies to well, all of science I would say and society and you, sh you should always think of this so listen up hard uh, change the theory based on the findings not the findings based on the theory sounds so simple seems to be so hard for so many people um, but yeah remember that kids always change your theory based on the facts not the facts based on your theory mm -hmm. um, as I said I love to hear if you have any stories of uh, people getting sexing or gendering wrong in the field or in general uh, or if you have any questions please ask them to me uh, if I can't answer them I have a bunch of friends that I sure can um, I'm going to link you a few articles uh, down below I'm also going to link you to mm, this specific archaeological context that I've talked about so you can read up about them and uh, I'm going to talk to you later so Bye-bye, and uh, have a good time.